Thanks, Mike, and thanks for everyone for coming along. Um, I guess what I want to um, sort of talk about today is just what real bushfire hazard is, and it's some of our learnings, I guess, from some recent um, events, but also it's something that we've known for a long time but has some serious implications if we don't fully understand it. The first thing, I guess, to, to get clear is where does the energy from the fire come from? And there are three primary sources that drive the fire, if you like, the fuel, and that's the obvious one. And that's where a lot of the debate sort of hinges around that if we manage the fuel, we manage the fire. We also have to appreciate that a lot of the energy of a fire is coming from the weather itself. So if we don't have severe fire weather, uh, we're not likely to have severe fires, even if the fuel is present. And likewise, topography. And this makes a big uh, difference if you're living in hilly terrain compared with if you're just living in the plains on, on flat ground. So the topography enhances uh, or makes more efficient the whole uh, combustion process. And so in Australia, one of the major factors that uh, drive fires is the spotting process, and I'll come back to that, and topography plays a big role in that. On the other side of this energy equation is the moisture, which tends to, to dampen down the process, it absorbs some of the energy. But of course, we know in the middle of a drought, there's very little moisture, so the dampening effect is, is much less. So the energy from the weather, the fuel, and the, the topography um, is given a, a more free reign, if you like. And the other side of it is the atmospheric stability. All our training tells us that the instability of the atmosphere or the stability of the atmosphere is really important, but our models don't specifically take it into account. And it's really important. It's been a, a major feature of all our uh, catastrophic events. So we can understand atmospheric stability in the sense of uh, like where you have fogs where the, the hot air has trouble rising, if you like, um, or in thunderstorms where it rises very freely. So when you have a fire and a smoke column that's rising freely, it means all the air is being drawn in at the base of the fire as well, and that can enhance the winds. And one of the things we've uh, seen uh, certainly in Victoria on a number of occasions and as well as in, uh, in Canberra in 2003 is those winds are, are cyclonic. They're, they're enough to snap trees off uh, or uproot trees, take roofs off houses and so on. So the wind that's being uh, experienced is not just the wind of the weather but also the wind that's been enhanced by the fire and that only really occurs where you have very unstable conditions. So yes, we need to deal with the fuel but we've also got to look at those other predisposing conditions. And here's a little uh, graph that I put together. I know it's lunchtime, so you should have warmed up a bit by now, but uh, what this is basically showing on the, the, uh, the bottom axis, the x-axis, is increasing severity of fire weather, the fire danger index. And on the, the left-hand axis is the uh, intensity of the fire. And one of the things that happens as the fire becomes more intense, more fuel actually gets incorporated in the fire. And if you look really closely down the bottom there, you see a little dotted line, which is the, um, the intensity of the fire that we can successfully attack the head of a fire. And you see that uh, under many conditions, under many fuel uh, arrangements, the fire is well outside our controllable uh, limits. So we have to have strategies uh, in addition to just straight suppression to deal with those occasions. The bottom line that is, I've shown there is basically what happens if you only had six tonne per hectare of fuel, which is a, a, a very low for a forest type situation. But with the, the severity of the, the energy coming from the weather conditions, it's still enough to get it over that threshold of uh, direct attack suppression. And it gets, you see around uh, 70, between 70 and 80 there where it suddenly kicks up. So the intensity of the fire is enough to ac actually start capturing fuels that aren't even affected by uh, a lot of controlled burning, which might be uh, canopy fuels or fuels higher up in, in, in trees, for example, in a forest environment. So even though we have lower fuels and it enhances our ability to suppress fire and it makes them less severe, it still can be um, beyond the threshold of control and beyond the, the threshold where damage occurs. So we just need to be clear about that. Here's an example, I guess, of what happens with the intensity with the increasing ground slope. There's almost a, an order of magnitude between flat ground and, and uh, really steep terrain in terms of how intense the fire is. So it's a major con contributing factor as well, but it goes beyond uh, just the hill slope. It's what it, does, it's what it does to the fire as well, and I'll come back to that. And another aspect here is this, these graphs are showing that the rate of heat output for a, a, one, a notional one hectare of land. 
where the blue line down the bottom there is showing what would happen if you just lit it from a point and let it gradually burn out under a, a fixed set of weather conditions. And the yellow line at the other end is the other extreme where you have massive number of ignition points in that landscape, in this case every 10 metres across the landscape. And the total amount of energy released is exactly the same, but the rate at which it's released, the power of the fire, is increased dramatically. And that's what happens when we get spotting, a whole lot of spot ignitions. That's where we get a firestorm sort of uh, developing. So if under exactly the same conditions, if we get those massive number of embers and spot fires um, starting, then we get a very different result. And it's one of the things that was repeated time and again in the Royal Commission in terms of uh, people's experience of what the fire was like, they had fire coming at them from different directions uh, and the fire kept coming at them time and time again basically because they were in the middle of this very complex area of fire where uh, that had been ignited not by a fire front moving across the landscape but uh, thousands of ignition points. So just coming back then that spotting uh, is important and Underestimation of the role of spotting is really quite dangerous, both in, in the sense of how we plan for fire, but also how we communicate risk. So what I'm suggesting really is that we need to be thinking about the area of active fire rather than a fire front. And that changes the way in which we do our research, it changes the way in which we communicate uh, about fires. We've got to differentiate between the sort of the, the more usual fire moving across the landscape as a, a fire front compared with um, the catastrophic events we have where topography is included, uh, where we get this area of uh, fire that involves, uh, averages out the landscape in a, in a way that uh, is not so much of a problem under milder conditions. This is an example, just a photograph um, taken down Gippsland in Victoria um, in January 2009, so this is before Black Saturday. And what it's trying to depict here it's pretty clear, that's all right. Um, is a spot fire out in a, uh, it's actually a, uh, out in a bit of cleared uh, pine plantation, but it's been drawn rapidly back into the main fire front, uh, which you can see off to the right hand side there. Uh, the fire front's about a kilometre away, but the indraft of air to that main fire front is drawing one of those spot fires back uh, rapidly into that fire. Uh, a photograph that was taken 30 minutes earlier, the smoke was actually going the opposite direction, it was being blown by the prevailing wind. But it's now, within that kilometre, it's been drawn back into the main fire front. And another spot fire that you can see to the left there is the smoke from that fire is still being blown forward, so it's outside the influence of that convective indraft. So that's just a, a, a little example, I guess, of how, this, how important this convection column is and how these spot fires start to play a role. This is a, a Churchill fire, and when we're very close to the fire, it's difficult to see that it's actually the area of fire that's contributing. But in fact, the heat that's coming off, not just the flaming zone at the front, but also all the burning wood and um, heavier fuel behind the fire front that's adding heat to the convection column, uh, is all contributing to really the severity of the fire. So this is the same fire, just zoomed out. Uh, and what we can see here is this convection column is effectively helping drag this fire along and holding the fire together at ground level effectively by pulling the air in. So the way thunderstorms work, and we, we know about downbursts from thunderstorms and so on, the same process is happening in a fire. And at the top of this you can see a little pyrocumulus cloud, uh, which is actually adding more energy effectively to the fire, helping draw it forward. So when we look at somewhere like Marysville, that was hit by the fire, one of the things that's quite striking here is that you can see all the trees are still there. They've got green leaves on them. They've been scorched, but they, they haven't been burnt. And yet all the houses, well, the majority of the houses have been burnt through there. It hasn't been a big wall of flame that's gone through there. It's been bombarded by thousands of spot fires. The spot fires, the embers have set fire to the houses, and, and the houses have been the main fuel in this environment here. So what we're seeing here is evidence of this massive spotting that's been going on. Where are those spot fires come from? Largely been launched from the ridge back outside the town. So typically we'd think somewhere in a valley is relatively safe because the fire's got to burn downhill to get there. That's not the case when you actually scale the fire up and you actually have this massive area of fire uh, that might be eight or ten kilometres across moving across the landscape. It just gets incorporated in this uh, convective area. So I'm going to run out a bit of time here but um, 
I'll try and show a little bit of a movie here to um, give you a bit of a feel for what it's like. This was taken on Black Saturday uh, at Strathewan. The wind is blowing 60 to 70 kilometres an hour. You look at the smoke there in front of the fire front, you think there's next to no wind at all. So the, the smoke column is effectively blocking the prevailing wind. So we're downwind here of the, uh, the fire itself. The grass fire that you can see in the foreground there, the flames less than a metre tall. This is Black Saturday. We can see the fire's got to the top of this sugarloaf bridge here, and what it's done is launched all these embers, and we can start to see some of the spot fires going around to the south here, uh, that are just burning initially. Um, they're intense enough, but they, they, uh, they all start to uh, develop individually. But the convection column is influencing all of them. This guy's on his own at his home. He's um, decided to, to stay and defend his property. He considers his uh, area around him is uh, defendable. And as you look around the landscape here, you can see fire in the landscape. It's not just some big wall of flame that's moving across here. Strathewan, you might remember, was one of the areas that was hardest hit in this fire. This fire, on average, is moving at about 12 kilometres an hour at this stage. But it's not the sense you get when you're actually in it. And he's actually, at this stage here, has got fires around him. It's just in the middle of uh, some unburnt area at the moment. we're starting to see now some of those spot fires that weren't doing much before are now starting to join up, starting to coalesce. And every time those fires start to coalesce, they, their intensity is greater than if just the uh, a fire was moving through there on a, a single front. We can see the smoke being drawn back now. It's going from left to right. That's actually against the wind. It's been drawn into the main fire front. In Canberra, you might remember there was a quite a significant firestorm. Here we can see um, this smoke cloud, seeing how, uh, this smoke, seeing how it's starting to rotate. That was potentially the starting of a, uh, a major vortex that in fact collapsed and fell over. So here we see the flames sort of uh, flaring several Shit. tree heights. told me he deliberately didn't make too many comments to uh, <laughs> the top. Now the impression you get here is that the fire is actually passing to his south, to the what, what we're looking at, we're looking towards the south now. You get the impression that the fire is actually pa passing to his south. And I'll just stop it at this point and show you some modelling work that um, we did that helps explain what was going on here. So the range uh, to the right is the Sugarloaf range where the fires got to the top. The, uh, Jim Baruta's property, who's taking the camera, uh, the video footage is this house down here on the bottom right hand corner. And what we can see, yeah, the fire looks as though it's going to the south and eventually gets him. This is covering about an, an hour period of the, the fire, generally. But you can see it's quite complex lots of spot fires that are moving across the landscape. This ex exact same uh, footage we'll look at, this modelling process we'll look at uh, zoomed out a bit to get a better picture of what the, uh, the fire is generally doing. So now Jim Baruta's house is, is at about that point there. But what you can see is actually smack bang in the middle of the fire. It's not the impression you get from the video footage. But if you look very closely at what's happening here, yeah, it does g initially go to the south. I think this is covering about an hour and a half period, this little bit of uh, replay. 
So this is his, that's his house just there. So he's actually being surrounded by the fire. And so you can get the impression how people talk about being involved in the fire for a two or three hour period. Okay. So we've got to appreciate fires have different scales and the factors that are important to fire behaviour at those different scales changes over time. What's important when the fire is first starting becomes far less important once the fire is large. A lot of our thinking, a lot of our planning, a lot of our training, a lot of our building regulations are based around this sort of area here, um, which is somewhere between the crown fire and the, the intense surface fire. But the trouble is most of the damage is done, probably more than 90% of the life and property loss is occurring during these blow up conditions. And we haven't really described that extent terribly well. So our warnings need to be thinking more about the scale of the fire and how that's important. And that will depend on the nature of the topography you're in. So if you're in the Adelaide Hills, your situation is very different to if you're actually on the Air Peninsula, for example, where there's not much topography. You need to make a distinction between how much the topography is going to add to the fuels and the, the weather situation. We need to consider all the sources of energy, not just the fuel. So we've got to think about how severe our weather conditions are as well as the uh, topography. And we need to think about how big an area can get trapped, if you like, in the area of fire. And I'm uh, suggesting for a, a ballpark figure, we ought to be thinking of an area about eight to 10 kilometres in, in uh, extent, if you like, for a, a fire moving. Once it's well developed, it might take two or three hours to develop to that size but once it's fully developed. In the first couple of hours, it's a, a more typical fire, if you like. And I guess rather than being totally pessimistic about all this, the defensible, defensible space uh, and hazard reduction still is important and provides uh, benefit, but we need to put it into this broader context of how fires are behaving. So I think I'll just leave it there for now and uh, <laughs> adjust and have a go.